Uh, I, I too would like to add my thanks since I'm the first uh, uh, chair here to uh, to the organizers of this, uh, uh, I think, obviously very stimulating uh, conference to be. Uh, Emiliano, especially Fabio and the others that Emiliano has already uh, answered to the department for sponsoring it. Uh, to the uh, sponsors who have uh, contributed to make it uh, possible, uh, especially in my case, since I had to travel <laughs> halfway around the world to get here. <laughs> coming to Rome very much. Uh, uh, Saluti anche a Carlo. I had the pleasure of introducing Carlo the last time I was here, uh, and I introduced him as a, a, a maverick. Un dissidente, non anticonformista. Uh, which is uh, uh, the, just exactly the kind of philosophy that I like. Uh, 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 and he's, uh, of course, uh, anti-conformista uh, against uh, certain strong traditions in analytic or Anglo-American philosophy, uh, tanto come uh, uh, filosofia idealista, uh, idealist philosophy. So uh, it's, a, it's good to see, uh, uh, see Carlo again. Well, uh, we need to get on with the, the business at hand, so let me uh, introduce our first speaker, James, where are you? Yes. <laughs> oh, there you go, yeah. yeah I'm ready to hand. I, I, uh, my pleasure. Uh, I just met Jane, Jane personally for the first time, and it's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, Jane, how? James uh, Ladyman is from the uh, University of Bristol, uh, by way uh, originally of uh, Leeds, Stephen French, and so forth. He's uh, 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 combined for several contributions. Uh, James has a very wide philosophical interest. Um, and even in uh, uh, metaphysics, you might say, naturalized metaphysics as well as epistemology, um, and uh, his uh, reputation has uh, achieved new visibility recently. Uh, his uh, book written with Don Ross called Everything Must Go, a, a hard-hitting critique of um, some other approaches out there and an attempt to develop their own positive view. So, um, I see James is just about ready. This title is Revisiting the Semantic Approach. James, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And uh, reiterate everything you said about the conference. Well, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to revisit the semantic approach and think about what's at issue. I don't know if I've got anything particularly new or uh, amazing to say, but I hope to get clear about what the important issues for discussion of uh, the nature of scientific theories are and what's at stake here. I think sometimes that's lost in these discussions. So, um, given the title of Semantic Approach Revisited, some years ago, a long time ago now in fact, um, Stephen French and I wrote a paper called Reinflating the Semantic Approach which attempted to defend the semantic approach against criticism. And it has certainly been um, part of my way of thinking, but I haven't worked that much on it for quite a long time. So it was helpful to me to come, come back to it with a sort of fresh mind and think about what was really at stake. Um, by the way, the paper that uh, I mentioned, uh, Reinflating the Semantic Approach, when we um, submitted that to a journal, we got um, one report that said this is all true, but everyone uh, is boring and everyone knows it. And we got another report that says this is very, very interesting, but not at all plausible. And the journal rejected on the basis of both of those. Uh, okay, so that's my abstract, so hopefully I'll do justice to that. And the fundamental question I suppose before us is, what is a scientific theory? And the semantic approach grew out of, semantic approaches, really semantic approaches, grew out of responses to that question, that the, the response that was orthodox prior to the semantic approach arriving on the scene. Second fundamental question for us is how theories relate to models. So you often get this distinction made between theories on the one hand, models on the other, and the semantic approach has something to say about that, it says in fact, well, theories just are models. So these are the questions that I want to consider in, in what follows, and I hope we'll have plenty of time for discussion and have, I'll be able to hear what you have to say about them. What's the scientific theory? How do theories relate to models? 
So to fix minds then, um, let's say the theory is Newton's laws of motion and the models are uh, the model of our harmonic oscillator or uh, the model of a spherically symmetric mass and an orbiting test particle or something like that. And a third question that I would like us to think about is whether or not there's a special problem of scientific representation. Obviously, scientific representation is a species of representation in general, and some people have urged that there's nothing really particularly problematic about scientific representation per se. And these problems are all just problems about representation. How do we represent the world? How are we able to represent the world? And finally, uh, the question I'm perhaps most interested in is whether the nature of scientific representation is independent of realism versus anti-realism about science. So I'd be happy to hear if any of you think that I've missed out the important questions that are at stake here. But I take it that's why we step back from you know, little debates in the literature and just ask, well, what are we talking about here? If you have to explain it to a scientist, I think there's a physicist here, what are we talking about? Why do we care? Well, because we'd like to know what kind of things scientific theories are. We'd like to know how theories relate to models. We'd like to know whether scientific representation is different in kind from all other kinds of representation. And we'd like to know whether how we think about scientific representation can be separated from whether or not we're realists or anti-realists about science. Now that term realist or anti-realism, I mean, I guess everyone here that's a philosopher will know what that means in the sense that they, there's a whole cluster of things it means, but roughly speaking. Um, but for the physicist, I'll just say, whether we, realism is going to be something like science is we should believe it's unrestrictedly true or approximately true. That is, we don't differentiate among the bits of our scientific theory as to what, what we believe and what we don't believe. And the anti realism can say something like, well, I believe the bits about the observable world. I believe the bits about the phenomena. I believe that what the theory tells me about what I'll observe. I don't believe what it, what it says about the true nature of reality or something like that. So the old received view, and I, I mean, I call it the old received view because it's not the received view anymore. I think that people think that the semantic view is now the received view. The old received view was <clears throat> generated at a time when philosophers were in general very excited about logic and formal languages. And so they were thinking that theories can be represented as first order axiomatic calculi formal languages in mathematical logic. So on that kind of view, a theory, and if you look up what a theory is in a logic textbook, it will tell you it's the deductive closure of a set of axioms. So the theory is uh, primarily a set of sentences. I say primarily because even the received view uh, didn't take theories to be completely and only linguistic. By the way, I'm trying to be, to make my diction um, clear, that being a good Latin word, diction. Um, but if I'm not clear, then um, if you want me to repeat something I don't understand what I'm saying, please, please interrupt. Mm -hmm. Good, okay, so on the crucial component of the received view is the distinction between two kinds of vocabulary and then lots of what the received view was about was making theoretical science safe for empiricism. I think that's how I would put it, right? So showing how the theoretical part of the theory that had nothing to do with observational language, nothing directly to do with observation, could be understood by being related to observation directly. So, first of all, people thought maybe you could have correspondence rules that would just translate everything about the theoretical terms into observational vocabulary. And then they gave up on that and they went for something like a partial interpretation. But one way or another, they certainly wanted to explain how 
theoretical language could get a grip on the world or have meaning. <coughs> Models were important only insofar as they needed to be specified, sorry, it's a typo, specified, to fix the interpretation of theories. So at a certain point people thought, well, we need to talk about the intended interpretation of our language. And therefore a model became an ineliminable component of the received view. But they weren't centre stage, they weren't primary. What was primary was theory as linguistic entity. So it's that conception that theories are fundamentally linguistic things that I, that I, I, I'm happy to deny, that I want to deny. And insofar as the semantic view can be identified with the rejection of that, then I believe the semantic view. But as we make the semantic view more precise and more a positive thesis rather than a purely negative one, uh, it becomes more dubious and I'm less clear about exactly what I'm committed to. Now, roughly speaking, the semantic view, and I said before it should be called semantic views, there are, by the way, my presentation is somewhat lacking in citation, and I apologise for that. Uh, I, I, I take it that the literature here is very accessible and it's easy to find out who we're thinking of, but I guess we think about the received view, we're thinking about Carnap and Nagel and Hempel and others, and when we think about the semantic view, we're thinking about uh, Beth and Van Frassen and Fred Supi and Patrick Supes. So one way or another, these people say theories are classes of models, so straight away, um, you, things are being turned around. Rather than a theory being a linguistic thing and models only being important as far as they provide an interpretation of the theory, it's rather, no, theories are models. Linguistic component is, if anything, secondary. That's important that, when I say linguistic component is, if anything, secondary, because the dichotomy that says syntactic view, received view, theories are purely linguistic, semantic view, theories aren't linguistic at all, that's a false dichotomy, that's not how we should characterise things. Is a recent exchange between Hans Halverson and Van Frassen in philosophy of science, and the main uh, content of Van Frassen's re reply to Halverson is to say that Halverson has, saddled, has interpreted the semantic view as saying there's nothing linguistic at all, and the Van Frossen say that's not right. And in fact, if you go back to lots of original writings on the semantic view, it's clear that they thought there was a linguistic component. So Patrick Suppies thinks that theories are basically set theoretic structures. But he thinks that they're characterised by a set theoretic predicate, which is a linguistic thing. And Ron Geary, who I didn't mention when I just listed people, but was an important contributor to the semantic view, makes it very clear that as well as models, you have to have a theoretical hypothesis that asserts that the models are representing the world. Um, so what does he say? That the, the, the world is like models in some respects to some degree. So there may well be a linguistic component, but you're primarily thinking that theories are mathematical structures of some kind. Good, so when we say uh, they're mathematical structures, what do we have in mind? Well, I already said that Suppies says set theoretic structures. <coughs> And um, one of the things I want to say today is I don't think that we need to tie the semantic view to set theory. And it may be a mistake to do so for a reason I'll come on to. So let's say something about the terminology here, because there's a, a concern that the semantic view is trading on 
two meanings of the word model being run together. So, model in the sense of a scientific model, well, already there can be many different kinds. So we could have, for example, a scale model, which would be like a physical replica of a system, but made of different materials, made of different size, where the metrical, geometrical relationships in a concrete physical structure are intended to represent geometrical represent, uh, relationships in the target concrete physical structure. We could have a, a model that's something like a, another kind of concrete model could be a model of a molecule where we have little balls that represent atoms and rods that represent chemical bonds. And then maybe we're also trying to represent the geometrical structure, but one of the main things we're representing is just what atoms, what bonds, how many bonds are there, what atoms are bonded to what atoms. But then we could also have something like a billiard ball model of a gas, where nobody ever actually did that by having some billiard balls to represent the gas. Right? It's rather that they said, well, if we imagine the gas was like a bunch of billiard balls, it would have the gases behavior would have something in common with the behavior of the billiard balls, namely the, the elastic collisions. The, the, most of the time, the balls would fly around, not bumping into each other, but occasionally they collide, and so on. That the collisions would be subject to Newton's dynamics, and so on. So already there, we don't have an actual concrete physical system that is our model. And then when we become more abstract still, we may have, say, um, the model of a quantum field as a collection of quantum harmonic oscillators at every point in space. And now we've become, we've built one model out of another model and we don't have anything concrete at all there. So models in science are very diverse. They're, I mean, I've only just listed a few examples. There are many, many more that differ in all sorts of important ways. And then we have models in model theory. Now, what's a model in model theory? Well, it's usually a bunch of sets, a, a, a set theoretic structure. So when I produce a model for some set of axioms in the formal language, what I do is exhibit some set, some other sets that's, that represent the relations and the predicates and so on. And so the tendency is to think that, okay, the model is the set theoretic structure. But that's not strictly speaking correct. The, a model in the sense of model theory is a structure, and also we have to include the interpretation relation that relates the terms of the linguistic thing, the, the um, terms of the language, to the model. We also have to include the valuation function, which takes the sentences of the language to true and false under the interpretation. So. A model in the sense of model theory seems to be something quite different from a model in the sense of a scientific model. So why this connection, why is this connection made? Well, because both are being thought of fundamentally as sets. And when we think about the um, the model theory, we're forgetting about the valuation function and the interpretation. And when we think about scientific models, we're supposing that everything that can be, that everything important about them could be captured by some set theoretic description. We're focusing maybe on, the ma on mathematical models and using a kind of familiar 
set theoretic reductionism to say, well, anything that can be represented as a mathematical model, we, can, we know that we can do all of mathematics in set theory, so we'll really think of any mathematical structure at all as a set. And this, I think, is, is very problematic. So I'm going to spend much more time on this, but I would urge caution at this point and say that we need to think hard about this. It seems to me not correct to assume that just because when we started with the question of what are scientific theories, we'd like to know, well, if scientific theories are models, what are models? And if we're then told, well, models are just set theoretic structures, then it seems to be that everything is sets. Lots of people are happy with that, but there are all sorts of problems with set theoretic reductionism. And it seems too strong that just by thinking about scientific representation, we would commit ourselves to set theoretic reductionism. And it may be more faithful to scientific practice to say, well, models are mathematical structures, and then leave it an open question how we think about those mathematical structures, what, what account we give in the philosophy of maths. And you say, well, models are mathematical structures, and then I leave it as a, as a problem for another day what I say that mathematical structures are. Um, So I'll come back to my reservations about set theory in a minute, I think. Um, but for the moment, let me just raise this as an issue and urge caution. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some uh, a criticism of the semantic view now that's very influential, which is due to Nancy Cartwright in a paper um, with Rico Suarez and um, Tofik Shomar many years ago now. And in that paper, they call the semantic view the received view and argue that part of the famous aspect of Nancy Cartwright's view is to invert how we um, think about scientific theories and how we give our epistemic credence to them. So I think, roughly speaking, that Nancy thinks that philosophers tend to focus on high theory and general laws and think of that as those things as the content of scientific theories that's really important to which we should assent. That's what we learn from scientific theories. And models are just some sort of annoying, messy details that we have to uh, use to apply our theories, but they're not really, uh, they're epistemologically secondary. And she says, no, it's completely the other way around, really. We shouldn't believe in high theory. We should believe in the concrete particular representations that we have of systems that we, that we get from modeling. So there's this slogan, which is uh, not quite a quote, but she does say this in that paper. Um, science represents the world. I think the exact quote is science rep represents the world, not in its theories, but in its models. So she's saying high theory, the fundamental laws, aren't representative at all, concrete models are. And her <coughs> colleagues go on to say that um, the semantic view, by saying that a theory is a class of models, has something, I mean, she associates it with the um, covering law model of explanation. So the idea is something like, well, we can we just apply the theory to the world in some kind of automatic way. Everything that's necessary for application is contained within the theory. We just choose what initial conditions we have, and <coughs> la, the theory uh, represents the world. And she, I think, has done um, 
important work um, from which we've all learned a great deal to, to say, no, the process of model building is not automatic, it's a genuinely creative part of science. We can't just deduce applications of theories to the world from high theory. We have to do a lot of work to apply theories to the world. And models shouldn't be thought of as a lot of dispensable um, add-ons to, to, to theories. They're really, they're really important. They're fundamental components of science. Now, in that, all of, with all of that, I think I agree. Um, but I, I don't. I think she goes too far the other way then in saying that high theory doesn't represent at all. And so I don't see anything in her arguments that says there's anything more of a more than a continuum between high theory and uh, concrete model. So one of her objections, I mean, one of the grounds she gives to this, gives for this distinction, is the necessity of abstraction in arriving at high theory. And I would say that even in the case of concrete modeling of particular systems, we still have to use abstraction to a, a, a large degree. And so I see no grounds for a distinction of kind rather than uh, a distinction of degree. OK, so. So what have we learned so far, I suppose I'd say, that we've learned that theories are not just linguistic entities. They're not primarily linguistic entities. That models are very important in science. That thinking of a theory as just the high theoretical laws is inadequate. Um, and there's, Another important um, development, I think, that, that is worth drawing attention to, which is the work of, oh, sorry, another typo, just said Woodward. Um, Jim Bogan and Jim Woodward have a very influential paper in which they point out that we, the, the way that we think about scientific representation naively, we think, there's the world, and then we have our theory, and we apply the theory to the world. So uh, you've got some description of the world, and then the theory has some, if we think in terms of the semantic approach, we think in terms of some empirical substructure of the theory that's isomorphic to um, the world. And this is neglecting the fact that when we represent the world in science, we usually do quite a lot of the work, work on the world first, to get it in a form that makes it apt for representation by our theory. So, and I suppose this maybe can, we can think of this as an obvious point, but um, I saw myself some sense of giving a review here and taking stock, and I think this is an important thing that we must note. Uh, when we think about, about theories and, and modelling. So this distinction between phenomena and data is roughly speaking of the, the distinction between the raw, uninterpreted world in itself that we're interested in, which is the phenomena, and then what we actually represent in science, which is the phenomena put in the form of data. So naively, I suppose, I think of it like this. Um, if we were uh, making measurements in the lab, um, we'd be turning phenomena into data points. But then furthermore, we, what we'd often do is then say, OK, so we have um, a power law that describes the relationship between two variables. And now the job of the theory is to recover that power law. It doesn't recover the data points themselves. Now we may plot a graph through the data points, abstract some function that describes that graph, and then say, now that's what we've got to recover. We've got to recover the fact there's a quadratic relationship between these two variables, or a logarithmic relationship, or whatever it is. So I think this is a, 
and import them inside. Um, we represent the world via models of data, so we can't think we've got the world on the one hand and the theory on the other, and then maybe now we start to get more sophisticated, we think we've got theory and then we've got model of the theory and that represents the world. It's more like, right, well we've got theory and we've got model of the theory, but then we've also got world and we've got model of the world. And then it's between the model of the world and the model of the theory that we can establish some kind of um, some kind of representation relation. And but there's going to be several epistemologically important features of this. One will be that we will it will the way that we represent the world to make it act for scientific representation will be theory laden. We'll already be using theoretical concepts in how we turn the phenomena into data. But the other point about this is it potentially solves a problem for the semantic approach, which is that um, the semantic approach focuses on isomorphism or um, some kind of mathematical uh, relationship. And one objection to that is to say, well, it's kind of a category mistake to think that there could be an isomorphism between a theory and the world, because isomorphism can only be between a mathematical thing and another mathematical thing. But if we recognize that we are not representing the world directly, but rather representing a data model, um, then we already effectively have a mathematical construct that we've used to represent the world at some minimal level, and then the theory is related to that via a mathematical relationship, not to the world directly. Okay. Now, um, what are models? Well, we've said that um, they're important, that they're, they're part of a we're kind of ontologically committed to models in giving an account of scientific representation. In recent years, there's a lot of um, work being done which has really rejected the semantic approach account of models as something like set theoretic structures or mathematical structures, and focused instead on the idea that models are like fictions. So i say something briefly about this and maybe provoke you to defend this view in questions if you think it's um, better than I'm going to make it out to be. Um, so lots of attention been given to this view. The idea of it is, first of all, to agree that models are, in general, abstract entities. And then to make a further step, which is to say, if models existed, they'd be concrete physical things. So a frictionless plane on this view would be, it is a hypothetical or, or fictional concrete, concrete physical thing. It's not intrinsically a mathematical or abstract thing. It's, it's abstract only in the way that uh, my fictional brother is abstract. Abstract in virtue of not being concrete. But of course, if I had a brother, well, my brother would have to be a concrete human being. Um, but in the same way, according to this view, if these models existed, they'd be concrete things. And then the idea is that this view can explain <coughs> how we learn from models, um, because it's like how we learn from fiction. Supposedly, we can learn a lot from fiction. So if I read um, the stories of Conan Doyle, I'll learn a lot about late 19th century London. And supposedly, you know, that this is analogous to how we learn from models. And what motivates this view is the same thing that 
Cartwright has made so much of in thinking about high theory, that models um, embody false assumptions, idealizations and approximations. So I want to say what I think is wrong with this. First of all, the analogy with learning from fiction seems to be a bad one. Because the only reason I can learn anything about 19th century London from the novels of Conan Doyle is because Conan Doyle already knew a lot about 19th century London and he incorporated that knowledge into the fiction. But when we do scientific modelling, we learn things that we didn't know before we did the modelling. So it's disadvantages. There just is no, no content in um, War and Peace about France and Russia and how those um, and, and, and the Napoleonic War that wasn't knowledge that Tolstoy had that he put into the novel. But if I decide that the nucleus is of an atom is like a drop of water in some respects, then I learned things I didn't know before about the nucleus by modeling it so. So that's uh, one point. Second point is that it certainly must, much more must be said to establish that a model is like a fiction just because it involves false assumptions or idealizations. All the time we use idealization um, to talk about real things. It strikes me as, um, I mean you could describe things this way, but it strikes me as the perverse to do so if I say that um, the Earth is a sphere. It seems pretty straightforward that what I'm doing is talking about the real Earth and saying that it's like a sphere. I'm not talking about a hypothetical, fictional, spherical, perfectly spherical Earth and then saying that that abstract object is like the real object, the Earth. So, well, that, that sounds like a strange way of describing things when I use ordinary language to talk about the world that I idealise all the time. I don't thereby think of myself as not talking about the world, but talking about some fictional world, which is then supposed to be in some way like the world. I'm just directly talking about the world, and I'm saying of it that it's roughly spherical, or whatever I'm saying, you know, the surface of the Earth is locally flat. Um, and so on. So, I don't, I, I, I don't think this view is well motivated at all. Models seem to have much less in common with fictions than they um, seem, seem to be more unlike fictions than like them. Of course, there are, there's some things you can say that they have in common, but not enough to say that models are fictions. Okay, so we can come back to that. Now, one of the um, why does it matter uh, whether we think of model, whether we think of theories as like sets of sentences or like mathematical structures? Well, one reason it matters is it, it, it matters for how we think about um, truth and representation. If we think that theories are sets of sentences, then we're going to think that representation is just analogous to linguistic meaning. If we think of theories like mathematical structures, then we think about representation differently. And standardly, what people have said in the literature uh, about representation given the semantic approach is that we have to use the notion of isomorphism. And so this is where um, the semantic approach is very closely related to structuralism. 
where structuralism is very roughly speaking the idea that science represents the world structurally or up to structure or science represents the structure of the world and so on. Now the reason why these things are connected I suppose is fairly obvious. Um, I suppose everything I'm saying is fairly obvious. But I'm hoping that I'm rehearsing it clearly for you so that we can get the issues on the table and have a good discussion about them. Um, it's often said that mathematics characterises its objects only up to isomorphism. So for many people, that's what's distinctive about mathematics. Right? That's the difference between mathematics and other ways of thinking. Sometimes people say mathematics is the science of structure. So if I'm uh, doing mathematics and <clears throat> you show me that the mathematical system you're thinking about is in all respects structurally the same as the mathematical system I'm thinking about, and I'm a mathematician, then I'm going to think it just is the same system. There's going to be no further question about it. And isomorphism is just the notion of a structure-preserving map between two systems. Now clearly, isomorphism is too strong a notion for many cases of scientific representation. But the critics of structuralism and the semantic approach have argued that Isomorphism is neither necessary nor sufficient for representation. So that's a major kind of line of objection. So the idea that isomorphism is not necessary goes back to Plato, where, no, is it? No, I can't remember now whether it's the sophist or the, the fetus. And then someone who's classically trained can tell us. Um, but in there, um, Socrates is talking about how someone has built a statue. And naively you think, okay, if you're going to build a statue of me, and I urge you to do so sometime, uh, and you wanted it to be like a life-size statue, then it would be fine to make it structurally isomorphic to me. It would be fine to make my nose on the statue exactly the same dimensions relative to my cheeks and my ears and so on, right? Make everything metrically the same. But if, as is more probable, you were building a gigantic statue for people to look up at, it wouldn't be appropriate to make it structurally isomorphic to me. Because the viewpoint of people looking at it is such that when they looked at it, it wouldn't look like me if it was so made. And this is the example Plato describes. So the sculptors know very well that the technique requires that when you're going to be looking up at the statue of, who, who would it have been? Alcibiades, you know, or some great general you will, it, it will only look like a, a nice, well-proportioned human face if the actual proportions are, are not those of a human face. So this establishes that isomorphism is not necessary for representation. And, of course, isomorphism isn't sufficient. Why not? Well, uh, you know, this chair is isomorphic to this chair, but this chair isn't a representation of this chair any more than that chair is a representation of this one. Now, um, I think that the second objection there is not, um, is, is important, but not fatal for the idea that 
representation is about isomorphism because, of course, we can say, well, it's not sufficient, but we need to add more. We need to take it that one thing is being used as a representation, that this thing is intended to represent that. But structuralist accounts are really in trouble if uh, isomorphism is not necessary. But I think I already gave the clue as to how to respond to that by saying, well, isomorphism is too strong. And what one needs is some weaker notion, but there's still a notion of preservation of structure to some extent. So my response to this line of objection would be, in cases of scientific representation, we look for structure-preserving maps, or uh, perhaps well, maps that preserve structure to some extent, but they may also do other things. They might scale things up. They might systematically um, distort things in some way or other. Uh, nonetheless, there's still going to be some kind of structural relationship between the big statue and the person. It's not as if there's no structural correspondence between them at all. Now, the really... Um, objection that many people take to really um, destroy the idea that, of, of structuralism is the Newman problem for, that, that he raised for Russell. So what's that about? Well, Newman's a mathematician. He wrote a review of Russell's analysis of matter. Russell said that science represents the world, only, only represents the structure of the world. And Newman says that Structural, purely structural representation is completely trivial. And uh, the reason why it's supposed to be trivial has again to do with set theory. If you think about structure in set theoretic terms, then all a structure is, is some particular collection of sets, of subsets of the domain. So if you take the standard way of representing properties and relations in set theory, they are just sets. And it's guaranteed that, given us a set of the right cardinality, all of the sets that represent all possible relations at, on that domain will exist. So, Newman says, Saying that we represent only the structure makes our um, claim about represent that makes our representation completely trivial. All we could possibly be claiming by claiming that our uh, we have a representation is that we know the cardinality of the domain. We know how many things there are. Well, um, this is why I think that we shouldn't think about structure in set theoretic terms. Um, it's, I mean, philosophers have got themselves into the idea that, uh, because this is how we formally represent things so often, that a relation is just a set, that um, you know, properties are sets of possible worlds and so on. But, um, Intuitively, that's not what a relation is. Intuitively, uh, for two things to be related is not the same thing as for some set to exist. And thinking about relations extensionally is, um, is just one way of thinking about them and not a very intuitive way of doing so. So I think, without having anything much more to say about it, that the way around the Newman problem is just to deny that structure means set theoretic structure. Now you say, well, what on earth do you mean by structure? And then I'll say, well, just what mathematics describes and what I mean by isomorphisms and structure preserving mappings are the kinds of relationships that we describe when we use mathematics to relate one mathematical structure to another mathematical structure. And often we use set theory, but um, we can think of set theory as a convenient common language in mathematics rather than thinking of it as telling us what mathematics, what mathematical structures are. 
Okay, well, I'm going to speed up because I'm running out of time. Um, the most important recent book in the study of representation is this book by Van Frassen. And he has this radical view in there that um, solid representation is essentially indexical, <laughs> uh, is really moved along in the direction of pragmatism. He says that, and this is skip he has this analogy of a map. He says that I can't use a map as a representation unless I know where I am on the map. So I have a map of of Rome that they gave me in the hotel. The, um, the hotel is actually not on the map, which so, uh, according to Van Frassen at least, the map tells me nothing. I can't locate myself with rela in relation to the map. I know nothing. And of course you can say, well, no, I, I can't use the map without knowing where I am on it. But I can see by looking at the map things about Rome. And um, if I have a map of some terrain, I may not have a clue where it is in the world, I may not know anything about where I am in relation to it, but I may be able to see that it's a, a region of mountains and valleys, or uh, somewhere topographically very boring by looking at the map without knowing anything about where I am in relation to it. So, but the, um, the argument for indexicality rests on more than the map analogy. It has to do with what um, Van Frassen calls the coordination problem, which he takes to be, I think rightly takes to be, a central problem for um, 19th century philosopher scientists. Um, you know, this tradition of worrying about this problem was initiated by people like Helmholtz and Poincaré and Hermann Weyl, not, not particularly by, by professional philosophers, so I'm pretty <coughs> sure that it's a genuine problem, not one that philosophers are kind of finding in science where scientists don't find it, which is the problem of how we coordinate our scientific representation with the world. And Van Frassen's conclusion is that we, at a certain point, have nothing more to say than just, well, we're using it this way to talk about that thing. So, Representation, that, that there's a representation between some structure and the world. Well, it, it, there being an isomorphism isn't sufficient. We've seen that. What is the extra ingredient? Well, I said, well, even if you do think that isomorphism is necessary, or some kind of structure preserving, some kind of structural relationship is, is, is necessary, that's not going to be sufficient. There has to be more. What's the extra ingredient? The extra ingredient seems to be that someone is using it to represent the world. And so, according to Van Frassen and other pragmatists, representation can't be reduced, defined, or eliminated, and can't be naturalized. Now, I see this as a, a fundamental challenge. It may be true, but it seems to have pretty important consequences if it is true. Um, so I think it's something important for us to, to think about. After all, um, we're natural creatures. Uh, I would be tempted to believe in the supervenience of everything about us and our mental lives and what that would include, what we're thinking about, and that when we're using a map, we are taking it to be a representation of Rome, or not. All of that's supposed to supervene on the physical. Uh, if representation can't be naturalized, it seems like we're suggesting that there's more in the world than all the physical facts, that there's, all, that there's something that doesn't supervene on the physical. That's a strong and important thing to learn if that's something we should learn. Okay, I'll very quickly just say something about about this. So, uh, Van Brassen claims that his account of, of solid representation is independent of his anti-realism about science, independent of his constructive empiricism. The thing that, that, that what we've just talked about, what I've just talked about, suggests that can't be right. More generally, you might think, 
the history of philosophy, accounts of how we represent the world don't seem to be independent of broad issues of realism and anti-realism. But Roman Frigg also claims um, that his work on models of fiction is independent of the realism claim. I think it's another important thing for us to think about. I'm skeptical, I think not. I certainly think that how I think about realism going the other direction, how I think about realism requires a certain kind of account of scientific representation. Um, my own view is partly motivated by the thought that much scientific representation is ineliminably mathematical and structural. So if you ask me how quantum field theory represents the world, I have no idea how to translate it into ordinary language or some supplemented language of um, some set of objects and properties and relations. I can say things like, well, well, first we'll think of the system as a collection of quantum harmonic oscillators, but that's already to be you know, deeply involved in mathematics. Um, and if we start thinking about um, propagators and path integrals and so on, but even in more prosaic cases of scientific representation, I think that one thing we ought to have learned is that, and I mean, this is even true, out, I think it's definitely true outside of physics as well, if you think about economics, about uh, biology, evolutionary game theory, representation of the world is involves mathematics. It can't be translated without residue into non-mathematical language. Okay, well, um, I've said quite a lot. Hopefully, you know, not too many arguments, but hopefully provoke some questions. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, James, I'll interview just briefly to say I think James has given us a, a, a terrific uh, uh, and intuitively intelligible uh, background as well as indicating some of his own uh, uh, quite developed views on these matters. And it's fine with me if you want to handle your own question. Yeah, just, a, just a small point of um, your perspective, I guess, uh, which, which is this. Well, you are, I think, a little bit ambiguous on this, so I don't quite know exactly what you think, but let me put it to you. So, is there any, um, any real reason to ratify theories and models in, in the sense that theories are X, or models are X, theories are mathematical, or models are mathematical structures? So, instead of that, one might think that uh, uh, as philosophers of science, what we do, we represent theories. And its models. For, for certain philosophical purposes, we have certain questions in mind about science that we want to answer, and we represent theories and models in order to say something about the interrelationship and how they relate to, to reality. Um, there's a difference between saying that um, for these philosophical purposes, it's very, it's very good to represent theories of, say, models as mathematical structures, blah, blah, blah. There's a difference between that and saying that uh, more is all mathematical structures. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So I so the identity criteria, I mean there are lots of things in the back of the talk about at all. The identity criteria for theories are is obviously really problematic. Do we take um, Hamilton's mechanics to be the same thing as Newton's theory? Are they reformulations of the same theory? Are they two different theories? And so on. Now, an extreme version of that, you might say, there's just no such thing as Newton's theory. It's not an entity. Um, we've got lots of techniques. We've got lots of things written down in books. We've got all sorts of things we do. It's all heterogeneous. And then it's a kind of idealization and abstraction in itself to say there's such a thing as Newton's theory and then ask the question, OK, what is it? Is that kind of the point? Yeah. 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 Possibly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel the force of that worry. I think you, know, you get a similar problem um, 
if you think about uh, a piece of music, you know, you might think, well, is there such a thing as you know, Beethoven's Third Symphony? You might think, no, there's some inscriptions on paper, there are some concrete performances, there are some family resemblances between these things, but there's no single entity that is um, the symphony. The reason why I um, would resist that deflationary way of thinking about it is that I think that um, I think it's probably true that Hamilton's theory is not Newton's theory. What's that question? Um, but they're importantly related, <coughs> and I think that um, both theories are combinations of linguistic and uh, mathematical entities and I don't think you'll get very far if you're a completely eliminativist about mathematical structures in science if you say there are no such things but I, I don't suppose that's a very good I haven't given an argument for that but that, that would be my answer their own personal view would be Something like, well, I'm ontologically committed to mathematical structures. I think they exist. I've, if you go the other way, it's very difficult to see how there's something that we all, we're all talking about. And it's very difficult to make sense of our discourse and the way we perceive it. Unless we think that there's an object that we're all talking about, um, the theory. Uh, yeah, I take the point. I think it's a very good point. Very brief, yeah. Follow up. I'm wondering if I never follow up myself. Yeah. If it matters for the reason that, um, say, your criticism of these fictional expositions, yeah. I wonder if some of these guys have this other perspective in mind when, when they talk about models as fictions. Like yeah. They just want to brief some models as uh, being analogous to, to fiction. You know, just you know, to say something informative about some some aspects of modeling. Yeah, um, sure. So, but so I think that's not what they are saying. Yeah. I mean, they say they literally are fictions, okay. and they say they literally are abstract objects. Mm -hmm. I agree that they could they could do that, but they, but they don't. Yeah, they should. Could, could I just tag on here before we maybe change the subject? Uh, an extreme version of the uh, somebody who worries about the difficulty by defining individuating theories and who thinks philosophers just get all tangled up. In that issue, and that's a, dis a distraction of the uh, Peter Vickers at the University of Durham with his uh, theory elimination view, uh, who says, well, you know, we, we for certain purposes can specify a, a group of propositions that uh, relate to one another in appropriate ways for that, uh, that reason. Uh, uh, do you find that kind of approach attractive at all, or, 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 or just to be dismissed out of hand? I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand, but I think you've got to appreciate why there's a sensible reason why people say things like that. So I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand, but I wouldn't go that way myself. But I agree, there's always this worry that philosophers reify. Um, but you know, I think there are certain cases which push you very strongly in the other direction. I mean, one that the early proponents of the semantic view made a lot of, which st I still think there's a lot to this, is quantum mechanics, where you had matrix mechanics and wave mechanics. They looked like very different theories. They're superficially different mathematical structures. Um, and, and then there's this theorem that says that there's an isomorphism between these two structures, that they're both representation, they're both really talking about Hilbert space. And what the scientists did, basically, I mean, the community seemed to say, all oh, right, that's the theory. Uh, it's the abstract structure that both these two concrete versions of it have in common. We'll take that to what quantum mechanics is, is really a say in the world. That's, that's the, the quantum theory. So Dirac and Vile, I think, were the people who said most explicitly, let's take the structure that wave mechanics and matrix mechanics has in common to be the content of the theory. Now, doing so wasn't just a convenience, it was then incredibly fertile for the further development of science. Questions that 
could only be asked, uh, the questions that you would have to ask if you thought it was one or the other were ignored and people just got on developing the application of this abstract structures, uh, developing how to apply this abstract structure to different um, physical situations. So I'm quite moved by that kind of case to say we can identify some core content um, and it's a, a fact ends up being what's the only way to identify that is, is as uh, a mathematical structure. And would that be a case of a complete structural isomorphism or an example here of partial? Uh, I mean, it's an interesting case. So Fred Muller wrote a, a, a paper, a detailed study of this, and he shows that, in fact, um, what Schrodinger's full theory and Heisenberg's full theory aren't really completely isomorphic. But then that's kind of risk my mill because what actually happened was people ignored the bits that weren't isomorphic and only concentrate on the common core that was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's, let's go to, back to the audience. Yeah. Richard. Thank you. Thank you. No, before, yeah, yeah. Uh, first one, please. Um, yeah, you, you, you were saying that, that you see a connection between the representational question and Really, yeah, I tend to agree in general. But looking, for example, specifically at object structure rules and the fictionist approach to models, would, would you think that such a fictionist approach is just not the nicest point of departure for looking at object structure? Or would you think that there is an actual incompatibility between? Oh, um. Well, there's an incompatibility insofar as I think my view is incompatible with anything false and the model's description of is false. Uh, I don't think that a frictionless plane is a hypothetical concrete structure because if it was a hypothetical concrete structure, it would have to be made of something. It would. And there are all these details that are just left out. It seems to me clearly what a frictionless plane is, is a kind of abstract entity that where it's, it's basically got some mathematical properties and then stuff said about how that's supposed to relate to real physical concrete structures. So, um, the problem with the model's suspicions view is I think it, it takes the idea that models involve falsehoods and then immediately jumps to them being fictions. But there are lots of things that are falsehoods but aren't intended as fictions. So now uh, I'd have to think a little bit more about exactly whether I can direct and get a direct problem for structural realism. And for those who don't know, by the way, I mean, I think what's on to structural realism? I mean, that's a difficult question. Uh, but roughly speaking, I think it's just the view that there's no reason to believe that the, the world as described by our there's reason to believe that the world as, as described by our best science um, doesn't have the nature of uh, independent individual objects and then relations between them that can be better thought of as a complex relational structure. That, I'll, have a, I'll, just, I'll try that as a claim of what it what that amounts to. Now how exactly that relates to models as fictions, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I see it, I mean it's certainly key to how I think about things that models are mathematical entities, not hypothetical concrete physical entities. So Jill, yeah. I have many comments, so perhaps I start from the last one, which stands directly from the last discussion. So it amounts more or less to say 
would you say that the surface of that desk is flat? Right. So, what extent? In many contexts, it's, it is enough to say that it's, it is flat. Right. It works. It's a good description of a surface to say it's flat. Or a wall. It's good. If I have one uh, picture on it, I just have to specify the coordinates to say, okay, locate, put it there. Yeah. If I want to be more accurate, then I have to go into the structure of the wall or the desk. And then I would say that it's rough, it's not flat. Right. So the description as a rectangle or a flat surface or whatever, it's, of course, approximately, it depends on the extent you want to go deep into the details. Uh, and that goes back to what we need. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I'm too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so I think it's quite funny when we talk about the Earth as a sphere. Everyone says, yeah. oh, it's not really a sphere, because actually it's slightly flattened at the poles. Um, but we know it's, it's not really a sphere because it's got all these bumps all over it. Because at the scale, I mean, the, the, the mountains yeah. and the valleys at the scale we're talking about are. If I were to land uh, a module on the surface of the Earth from another planet, I shouldn't worry about those bumps. You should worry about those bumps. That's right. If I have to describe the motion of the Earth around the Sun, I shouldn't worry about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So. Um, you think it depends on purpose? Yeah, if I am to describe the motion of the Earth around the Sun, the Earth is a point, no structure at all, not even a sphere. It's a point. In as much as I am to describe the elliptic orbits around the Sun, it's a point, not even a sphere. If I am to describe the motion around its axis, then it's a sphere, or perhaps an ellipsoid, or perhaps something better and better and better. If I am to land a module on the surface of the Earth, I have to worry about every single corrugation of the surface. Because, of course, I have to land the module on a flat spot if I want to do to the happy afterwards. So. Yeah. Okay, so, but I think that the, what I want to throw back at you, I suppose, is that uh, we can always say, well, it's useful to think about this thing this way for these purposes, so let's do so. But science sometimes seems to offer us more than that. It seems yes. to be suggesting that it can tell us something about the real nature of reality. It won't just be, uh, oh, think about it this way if you have this purpose, right? So that, um, if you just say what you said, that's compatible with, well, you know, if I want to model the water as, um, I might think, think of it as continuous, but now I might worry about it um, some processes inside the water, so now I'll model it as atoms because that's convenient and so on. But at no point will you say the, the water is made of H2O. But when you say when you say the water is made of H2O, it seems like you're saying something more than just for these purposes you should think of it this way. You're saying yeah, but there is so always well, something deeper than nature. that. There is always something deeper than that. Good. H2O is deep, but not the deepest possible point of view we have so, so far reached about the nature of matter. Okay, so I there agree. is a deeper. I agree. And what part of what, what water is? That's right. I, I agree. And so what motivates my own view is really that I don't see that with any evidence that that's necessarily going to stop. I mean, maybe it will. I don't agree with you. When we look at uh, quantum field theory, then we have this effective field theory. It has some, we write down a Lagrangian with some particle degrees of freedom. But we know that those are emergent degrees of freedom. If we go to some deeper level, those particles don't exist. We have some more high energy theory. And now, I think the standard view is that yes, but, there must be some bottom level description where we can just say these are the objects and uh, this is the nature this of This is a metaphysical assumption. This is a metaphysical assumption. I agree. I think it, it's a metaphysical assumption. Now, what I would say is we don't have any grounds to be sure this metaphysical assumption is false. Yes. But also, uh, we have some reason to think maybe it's not true. Therefore, when we look up science, we shouldn't assume this metaphysical assumption. 
If we're not to assume it, then uh, do you want me to stop talking? Um, right. Be very quick because we were supposed to have a break. And we got started a bit late, so I'm being generous, but uh, <laughs> but we needed to a quick break. In. I can just stop in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> So perhaps we should stop now. To, to okay, well, I'll call it to the time to meet And perhaps it would help. I've not looked at the map or whatever's in our little folders. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, I don't know, you could, you could tell people where the nearest restroom is, for example. Or is it? Yeah. Thank you.